Is there someone else up there? I don't yeah. know. Is there? No, you don't have it on your computer. All right, so we're back live. This is Senate Health and Welfare, and um, we're looking at. Uh, we've had we've had some folks requesting to testify on the one second. Yes. You're going to have to turn your um, sound off, Allison. Oh, oh, it is on. Oh, oh, yeah. With you. Did you do it? Say something. I think so. Okay. okay. So we've had we've had folks asking to testify on the sections related to prevention for sexually transmitted diseases, and uh, so we're, we're we're doing that today for S one fifty one. S one fifty one will have some um, language changes when we come back to it next week. Uh, based on input from the interested parties who have been working outside of committee. Not me, but um, I've asked them to work outside of committee, and they are doing that for us. So they'll bring some language in next week. So today we're listening to folks who have requested to testify. And um, Allison, you're here. If you want to um, take a seat up at the Oh, um, Sandy was going to go first, if it makes sense. But on the on the thing, it said Jen was going. So I think that's probably why she's, she's not right. here. Oh, she's not. She just listed always with her. Okay, let me so, know. Sandy's going to be rolling. I'm sorry. I can, of course, go. I'm sorry. I was planning on. Um, you know, we have Heather Stein available. Um, is that okay? We can have. Any order here, as long as we have people testify. Okay, as long as it doesn't mess you up. No, no, it doesn't mess me up. Okay, perfect. No, That'd be so great. It's okay with you? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. All right, Dr. Stein, you're here with us. Um, thank, thank you for being here. Uh, so, uh, welcome. We're going to introduce ourselves in the committee so you know who we are. We'll start over here. Hi, I'm Senator Martine LaRock Hewlett from the Chittenden Central District. Good morning, Senator Dave Weeks, representing Rutland County. Uh, Jenny Lyons uh, from Chittenden Southeast. Jerry Williams representing Delaware County and also. Hi, good, uh, good morning. I'm uh, Senator Ruth Hardy from the Addison District. Okay. So um, we're, we're beginning with um, Dr. Stein. Uh, so why don't you introduce yourself for the record and then we'll listen to your testimony and then we'll go to uh, Dr. The Dr. Ryder is here. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me. We can. That's fine. Uh, I'm a family and addiction medicine doctor. I work in uh, Chittenden and Grand Isle counties, mostly at a federally qualified health center. Um, I heard about this uh, cha recommended change uh, to the language to permit uh, more discussion with minors about prevention of sexually transmitted infections and as a medical provider serving this population and of course all ages as a family medicine doctor it seemed a really obvious and important part of medical care and treatment to be able to speak about ways that sexually transmitted infections some of them which can have lifelong consequences can be prevented. We're already allowed to discuss treatment uh, with minors in certain circumstances. So this is really expanding it sort of logically to allow us to also talk about how to prevent these sexually transmitted infections, which we know can be so impactful for health. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you for that. So do you have your testimony and writing that we could post on our webpage? Uh, I do not, but I can prep that for you uh, very quickly. All right, that would be terrific. So uh, what I'm going to ask of you is if you don't mind staying online because we're, we're going to hear other testimony and then uh, we may have further questions of you as we go forward. And I'd say that to all the folks who are testifying today. So thank you. Any questions for Dr. Stein? So uh, I do, I have a question. So uh, I think we're gonna hear, and I'll ask it now, because I think we are gonna hear concerns about 
uh, lack of uh, not having the parents in, uh, involved in uh, prevention, information, or, uh, or treatment. Uh, can you talk about the role that parents and families play in your uh, as, as a parent myself and somebody who treats really families, that's one of the real benefits of family medicine, that in many cases we're caring for the minors as well as their families. The best and most effective treatment is to have these conversations involving parents. But unfortunately, we find ourselves in cases where uh, the parents are not available uh, due to their own health concerns, due to sometimes mental illness, addiction, custody challenges. Um, I saw a young man. You, sorry, hold on. I'm getting feedback. Does somebody have something on? Maybe it's you. She's just in a busy office. You're in a busy office. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. About that. Um, we do find ourselves in cases where we have the opportunity to engage with minors. Uh, and their parents are not available. Either we cannot reach them or they're not able to accompany their youths in for well child checks or in for acute visits. And if we're not able to have these conversations when we're not able to reach parents, we really miss out on being able to deliver this important medical treatment and counseling. Um, and I can give an example of a, a lovely young man who I saw a couple of weeks ago whose parent has been in the hospital. Their, their only parent has been admitted to the hospital for weeks. So they really just were not in a way that they were able to make this appointment. And even though we can reach out to them separately, being able to have the conversation about preventing sexually transmitted infections as part of a well child visit. Um, for this kiddo, it would really feel terrible to not be able to have those conversations with them when their parents um, are otherwise not available. Okay, thank you. All right, so and, uh, any other questions? Oh, I'll, I'll just, again, ask if you just stay on to make the other questions as we go forward, thank you. Um, so um, Sandy Ryder is here, take the hot seat. I'll have some paper copies. I don't know if the committee wants them. Sure, if we can, if you have, do you have it online? I have it online also. Yeah, okay. If you send it to Kiki and we'll have it then on our web page. You should have it, Kiki. Okay. It's, it's posted. So, and I have so we're good. paper copies. Okay. Thanks. Probably unnecessary with all the other stuff you've always had to read. I'm past it, so don't think of that. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me to provide comments to your community. Uh, my name is Sandy Ryder. I'm a uh, medical physician. I have a primary care practice in Middenville, Vermont. I've been involved with recreation care of people of all ages, really, since my licensure in Vermont in 1972. Uh, I'm a founding member of Physicians for Informed Consent, uh, a big issue in this particular situation, and have been involved with, uh, as a medical advisor to Health Choice Vermont, uh, since its inception in 2013, when the first attempt to remove the conscientious exemption from parents was defeated, and I currently serve on this board. Also, like I think everyone here, uh, as a parent, I have a personal stake in this bill. S51 bill, quote, as a bill related to pay parity and prevention, uh, of any related sexually transmitted infection, uh, I think should be opposed in its current form. As you know, it's a long and somewhat complicated bill uh, related to details around the Green Mountain Care Program. But in the middle of it is, I don't know if it's called Section 1107 or Chapter 1107, I'm not sure how to refer to that. Is it a unrelated uh, bill 
that um, certainly is not related to pay parity, but proposes uh, minor consent to treatment of any related sexually transmitted infections. There's already a legal right, as you know, for a minor to be treated for venereal disease. And I think the distinction important in this bill to appreciate is the difference between any trans, any sexually transmitted infection and venereal disease. It's a new definition. 1107, buried in the middle of S-151, is obviously unrelated to parity, as I said. It raises a number of important questions and concerns, all of which deserve their own um, careful debate in this committee, in my opinion. Particularly if transparency in healthcare is a goal, as stated in the bill's <laughs> advertisement, and not just the marketing gimmick. Apart from trivial, these concerns include a parent's ability to determine what is in the best interest of their child. Um, legality, safety of opposed, and certainly uh, future treatment programs, um, family cohesiveness, and certainly um, in my opinion, most importantly, the ability or inability of a minor to give proper informed consent to any medical treatment, including vaccinations and drugs, as will be allowed in this bill. I have included a section on data for context here. Only, I'm not going to go into it because it's, you know, not necessary. You can read it on your own with the provided links in the digital version. Just to say that you know, sexually transmitted illness, while it occurs rarely in Vermont, not rarely, rarely, uh, Vermont has had for at least since 2017, the lowest incidence of sexually transmitted disease or venereal disease in the old terminology, and also on a numerical and a per capita basis of um, Recently, there was a bullet put out by the Vermont Health Department citing the surge in syphilis around the country, but Vermont has not, and New England generally and Vermont have not shared in that, and Vermont continues to be the top of the list for the lowest incidence of sexually transmitted disease. So that's just for context. The only vaccines currently available for venereal disease right now are hepatitis B and monkeypox, neither of which are particularly relevant to minors, particularly since minors are required in the childhood schedule to be vaccinated for hepatitis B from a very early age. I think they see, see three or four injections at quite an early age. Never mind that they wear off by the time they're teens, but anyway. Um, Still, however, broadens the, the concept of venereal disease to include any sexually transmitted infection. I think it's important to understand the distinction between those two, and there might be some confusion about it. Uh, if you can already treat a child for a sexually transmitted infection, let's put it that way, or disease, uh, why the need for this particular bill at this time, particularly in the context of an unrelated Bill. Practically speaking, 1107, in this context, opens the door wide to any related vaccine for the present, including HPV vaccine or drug like a pre-exposure prophylaxis to HIV, which must be extraordinarily rare for 12-year-olds or 13 or 14-year-old modesty. Uh, this appears to be the bill's purpose. It can and should be understood partially as a stealth vaccine and drug bill. 
in this regard, there are literally hundreds of drugs and vaccines in the pharma's pipeline. I mean, hundreds, up to 300, up to 300, including vaccines for some sexually transmitted infections like um, chlamydia, um, sorry, herpes, gonorrhea, and others, I'm sure. These will all be, according to the, the rule in this bill, if it goes through arriving in the future and be uh, allowed minors to consent for. Furthermore, many of these new vaccines will be based on the unproven experimental and dangerous mRNA platform, which was deployed globally uh, by Moderna and um, Pfizer with, uh, in their genetic injections with, I'd say, fairly calamitous results. And I know that's controversial for some of you, or maybe, and I encourage you to read the link at the bottom of that paragraph where it lays it out, I'd say, in the most complete form that I've seen. Increasing the law of take of Gardasil HPV is admittedly the immediate goal of 1107. Human papillomavirus was not originally uh, conceived as a venereal disease, but marketed primarily as a cancer preventative. Although the vaccine is now recommended for women up to age 45, and there's some serious questions about that, in my opinion, it's not the place to go into it. It primarily targets boys and girls 9 and 10 years old at this point. It may prevent warts, but thus far has not been proven to prevent a single case of cervical cancer, which is its primary purpose. There are about uh, 200 subtypes of HPV. Uh, sorry, I got to put my glass. I to do that. 200 subtypes of HPV. And, you know, the HPV is known to be fairly widespread, of course. Significantly, though, it's generally asymptomatic, meaning it causes no symptoms. And approximately 90% of these infections will resolve, infections, not diseases, I stress, will resolve entirely on their own without treatment over one to two years. And I've seen one study that cites after three years, up to 96% are resolved. This is without a vaccination and without any treatment whatsoever. The HPV vaccine itself, however, is shown, uh, is shown to be particularly reactive and dangerous and is the target of lawsuits around this country and the world. Um, Mary Holland, who's uh, a law professor in, in New York and president of Children's Health Defense, has written an indispensable book in this regard called the HPV vaccine on trial seeking justice for a generation betrayed. It's indispensable to read this if you're wanting to dig into it and have time, which I'm reading on right now. And if she cites over 57,000 reports from VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Repent, uh, Event Reporting System, of disability and deaths. It was by far the most reactive vaccine in history until the COVID vaccine jab came along. Parenthetically, if Frank would be here, because I've been following this issue in Vermont for quite a while. S-151 Section 4 is reminiscent of the political tactic deployed successfully by this very same Vermont Senate in 2015. I don't think any of you will remember that, but Chairman probably us. To remove a parent's right to choose conscientious and philosophical exemption uh, to any vaccine required by the state for their child to attend school. In that particular instance, the abrogation of parental rights was introduced by a last minute amendment to an entirely unrelated bill. Sound familiar? And this is people. not last minute. I would like to clap. Okay, this is first. This is not last minute. It's been in here um, since last March or April. So 
I would like to clarify. And the other thing I'd like to say while I'm saying it is you said it's, it's embedded in the middle. There's also colorectal cancer screening embedded in the bill, which is also a medical. I stand corrected. Yeah, I should be. Thank you. Thank you. You know, parents have always had and continue to have primary moral and legal right to care for their children, and they're nearly always the best guardians of their children's welfare, unless proven otherwise by the state. That's the default position for parents. Taking medical decision authority over children away from the parents and giving it to anyone, let alone children, uh, violates any sense of respect for the prime importance of the family unit and family's role in caring for their children and as the fundamental building block of a stable community and society. Minors are neither legally competent nor developmentally ready to advocate for themselves or to make sound medical decisions. The U.S. Supreme Court has stated most children, even in adolescence, are simply not able to uh, to make sound judgments concerning many decisions, including their need for medical care yeah. or treatment. Lacking this capacity to make a thoughtful, mature decision implies a priori that genuine informed consent, the bedrock ethical requirement when caring for patients in the medical setting, is highly unlikely and in most cases not even, not even possible. States like Vermont are increasingly claiming that they, not the families, decide what is best in the best interests of children. Consider the implications of gender reassignment without parental knowledge or consent or safe site injection clinics for minors struggling with substance abuse or addiction or state vaccine mandates for which there is no account accountability or liability in the event of harm. And now, not just the right of minors to consent to sexually transmitted infection treatment, but also related, any related preventive services, which is, in my opinion, a deliberately vague and open ended term. Striving for a home run, the New York legislature has recently submitted a bill to allow children any age to consent to any medical procedure, I mean any age, uh, including drugs, counseling, vaccination, and even surgery, without parental knowledge or consent. The intent to weaken or even destroy the family unit is plain to see here. I have to ask, is this creeping incremental erosion of family values a policy trend that this committee and the legislature really want to impose on the families? What's a consenting minor to do should he or she experience a significant vaccine or drug reaction? Allison, the Allison, that Oh, sure. Okay, sorry about that. What's a consenting minor to do should he or she experience a significant vaccine reaction? Parents may not know the cost. They are prohibited from accessing their child's medical records. Or maybe uh, not permitted. Because neither the drug manufacturer, the state, nor the medical personnel administering the vaccine or drug can be held liable, well, I shouldn't say drug, vaccine in particular, should a minor experience a severe vaccine reaction, it falls squarely on the family to deal with the repercussions. Indeed, it's the parents and the family that are the last line of defense between the drug companies and their allied captured regulatory agencies and their children. The last one. Since 2000, the Vermont children under 18, in addition to numerous office and emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and disabilities related to vaccination, Bears has reported five deaths all involving 12 different vaccines. Furthermore, these reports represent a bare minimum. Um, a 2001 HHS FDA funded study. The so called Lazarus study found that less than 1% of all vaccine reactions were ever reported. So, can multiply whatever the data is by quite a bit. Should section four of S 151 buried in the middle of this otherwise unrelated, sorry, buried, 
I think I've retracted that, sorry. In the middle of this otherwise seemingly unrelated bill, I still have that opinion. This passes out of committee and becomes a law. Vermont will almost certainly face a lawsuit. Uh, I urge each of you to read Attorney Aaron's series May 2023 letter to the Vermont legislature, and if you already have. Entity six succinctly explains why and how minor consent to any vaccination is clear violation of federal law. Having recently won a similar case in federal court against Washington, D.C., involving minor consent for 11 year olds and others, Attorney Sirius pledged to undertake the same here in Vermont should this measure pass. To repeat, the minor consent portion of S-151 is clearly at odds with the stated goal of transparency and health care and should be withdrawn. If not, its significance deserves, at the very least, an entirely separate bill that allows parents and other stakeholders to have their, an opportunity to say, have their say. Does Vermont really want to waste scarce taxpayer dollars on a avoidable lawsuit incur the ire of families and parents and further erode trust already at all time low in increasingly increasingly authoritarian healthcare system. I hope not. that's the end of my testimony. I'm glad to take any questions. Thank you. Um so I think the truck of your testimony is that regardless of what happens between the uh minor patient at 12 years old and, uh, and up that the parent should be involved in any discussion around prevention or uh, entry that entry, but prevention in this case well or sexual part, that's partly right i mean in this whole issue around informed consent i think is front and center in this bill not only the child really can't imagine 12 year olds sticking up for themselves in the context of peer pressure inadequate information about the intervention and i somewhat disagree with this terminology about having conversations conversations does not mean informed consent and i just read this morning there's a lawsuit being uh uh brought on behalf of two families whose lovely daughters 111 114 died from the hpv vaccine and these acts these lawsuits are occurring here in Japan, in Denmark, I'm not sure where else, but they're fairly widespread. The HPV vaccine, which this bill would unleash, really promote at least, uh, is a very dangerous vaccine. So the issue of informed consent is very different from having a conversation. Parents are not advised of all risks, because I promise you, if they were told your child could die, many people wouldn't bother going there. So. Okay, thank you. All right. We're going to move on to Allison. We're getting a little bit behind, but this is a important for us here. I appreciate your time. Thank you. 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 So we're going to spend another 10 or 15 minutes and I, for the last five minutes, I'm going to have Jen come up and talk about the language that's in the bill and mm -hmm. any of the references that we've heard regarding federal statute law. Did I get kicked off, Kiki? Yeah, you're not in the meeting. Oh, um, do you think you can send me the link? Or actually, actually talk about the, what we should yeah. Do you want to send me the link again? Or? We should be able to use that same link. Okay, I'll try that. While we're, while we're waiting, I'm going to turn to um, to both Dr. Stein and Dr. Ryder, and just a quick question. Uh, as physicians, obviously, you're also concerned about uh, treating kids in the context of having parents available around. So maybe, um, Dr. Ryder, you've already indicated that you involve parents in all decision making when you offer prevention information to kids? Of course, uh, informed consent requires 
all the benefits, all the risk. And, and uh, not informed consent, but that any prevention information that you, and when you work with, have a, a child in your office and the parent, then you include the parent in all of those visits around prevention information. Well, I, yes. And, and just to say, you know, I've been practicing for a long time now. I've never seen a, a minor come in by themselves ever. Okay. If they did, and they were diagnosed with a sexually transmitted illness, I would have to report that yeah. to DCF, and that would trigger an investigation. They don't fall through the cracks unless they don't tell anybody. Okay. Don't that's fall. not prevention, although you're talking treatment now, but I'm talking prevention. So any of the prevention services that you offer to your patients, you have parents in the room, and you include them in the decision-making about the type of information you're offering to the child. So I'm just trying to sort out. Yes, of course. Of course, information is not part of this bill, honestly. It's that's that's the case and always, legal or not, information is always given to the best of my ability, always, including the risks. And and then just before we go to Allison, I'm gonna give Dr. Stein the same opportunity to answer that question if you don't. Can I make one more comment? Quick. Quick. It's important. <laughs> sorry. It's important in this bill to differentiate between infection and disease. They're not the same. I understand. Not the same. So I just want you know I can explain that later outside the this meeting because I know you're pressed for time. But it's an important so, distinction. So Dr. Ryder, did you want to comment on having uh, minors and parents for prevention. I, I assume you were indicating me and, and I appreciate that it, it sounds like in many practices in the state don't have minors uh, coming in for care. We're in sort of challenging um, custody situations uh, or having parents who are unable to come in for visits as I described in, in our work as a underserved medical center, we, we do see kids in those situations, unfortunately, who really do not have an engaged parent to bring into the process. Um, and I, I didn't, I, I confess, I didn't anticipate having to sort of defend the treatments that the FDA and uh, has approved in the CDC recommends, but I'll just uh, fall back on the uh, standing of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and there are very clear recommendations for treatment to prevent these infections. Thank you. Part of the professional criteria. Okay. All right, Allison, welcome. Thank you. Here you are. I know, finally. Yeah. You all know I've wanted to be here, so I really yeah. appreciate it. Caroline, thank you. Thank you all for being here as well. I really appreciate it. So Allison Nestafi, um, I guess I'm wearing sort of two hats here. One, I'm a mother, specifically, I have a 12-year-old daughter and have two older children as well. And then I also, um, as a healthcare professional, with I have a um, master's, in, master's of Science in Clinical Human Nutrition. I've had a practice in St. Johnsburg for 25 years. I've also taught at the Vermont State Colleges for 25 years, nutrition, human bio, and wellness for life. So this is very, very important to me, as you can all tell from my emails <laughs> and being here. So, um, so thank you for having me. So basically, I thought this was appropriate. We've got a lightning rod going on here, right? And obviously, at this point, you guys have heard from a lot of um, sort of mama bears, so to speak, and parents who have come out and said, wait, whoa, 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 what's going on here? What's going on here? So obviously, if any of you are parents, you understand that. But I also see what you guys are trying to do with trying to sort of broaden this out and how can we protect children? So really, the fundamental question is, who is responsible for the safety of the children? Can they do it themselves? My opinion is absolutely not. If a parent cannot be there, they need to have DCF be there. They need to have an advocate for them who is independent and has their best interest in mind. And that really is the bottom line, regardless of what's going on. Sorry, it's kind of emotional. I'll try to calm that down a little bit. Um, so the, this is what we're looking at here. And so I think what I wanted to look at, not just from the mom-parent thing, is why is this a lightning rod? Um, Every single week, I meet with families who have young children who are pregnant and are trying to decide, what am I going to do? Am I going to do the vaccine schedule? Am I going to inject my babies? 
I think if you're a parent, you know you would die. Any good parent would die for their child, right? So they're going to do their due diligence. They're going to dive in and be like, what is going on with this vaccination story? What's the anti-vaccine? What's the vaccine thing? What are they injecting into my baby? People want to know what's going on. So this is what I'm attempting to look at, because we all know the mom thing. The other thing, actually, before... Oops, sorry for that. Um, the other thing I want to say, too, is... Um, Unfortunately, I know your intentions here are you want to cover children and do what's best, but unfortunately, I feel like this bill is going to do the exact opposite of what your intention is, because all I can think about in every single parent that I've talked to about this is, okay, so who's dropping off the 12-year-old at the doctor's office? Is it Uncle Ernie? Predatory, abusive Uncle Ernie? Go do your thing. Shh, don't tell your parents right? Is it the 17-year-old boyfriend dropping off? I mean, I hate to talk about this, but every single one of us knows that abuse and predation is real. And unfortunately, I really feel strongly, as you can tell from the lightning rod part of it and all the other people reaching out, this is going to exacerbate and perpetuate abuse in children versus a, a doctor reaching out, look, we have a problem. If they can't go to their parents, then they should go to DCF or they should go to someone that is going to be able to take action and get that child protected. I hang out with 12 year olds all the time. It's who I hang with. They're my buddies. I have to encourage them all the time to assert themselves. You step up, say what you need to say. You didn't get the right change back. They gave you the wrong thing that you ordered. I'm constantly trying to get them to assert themselves and do what they need to do. So that's one aspect. This aspect, I'm gonna cruise through quick. I want to let you guys know every single thing that I say has a primary source document attached to it, and they're all linked in here. We talk about the broken system of vaccine safety. The bill that you have opens up the floodgates, opens up the pipe pipeline, like Dr. Ryder said, for vaccines. Unprecedented. HPV, I have one for each of you. 28 page vaccine insert. This is a package insert. Do you think a 12 year old do you think you can understand this? I mean, honestly, 6.1 adverse events, you should see the autoimmune conditions that come out. These have never been tested for cancer. They've never been tested for mutagenic, like damage to genetic material or infertility. So I have one for each of you and I suggest you read it and you see, can a 12 year old really go through this and do informed consent? Like that's a real question. That really is the question. Because we're not just talking about, so Dr. Gibson, Dr. Stein, I know that they care about kids. They wouldn't do the work they're doing if they didn't care about kids, right? And so obviously having a, having a conversation, sharing information is one thing. When you start talking about a treatment, a preventative treatment like a vaccine, it's a big deal. So I am going to cruise through this quickly. We have two ways we protect products, right? Self-regulation, market forces, people aren't going to buy it if it's going to hurt them. They're going to have lawsuits. Then you have regulatory agencies. This is what I teach all the time about the FDA in my classes. This is what I do. 1986, President Reagan signed the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. This broke it. This broke market forces. You cannot sue a pharmaceutical company if your child is injured or dead. That is what happened. It officially totally broke market forces. No person may bring a civil action for damages against the vaccine administrator or manufacturer for death or injury associated with vaccine. Alex. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. I appreciate that. I have a lot that I'm trying right. to get through. So okay. you have a for your message to be clear. Slow it down. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I will try. Okay, so ultimately the 1986 Vaccine Childhood Injury Act took away Americans' constitutionally protected right to trial by jury for vaccine damage and death. There is no other product on the market that has this level of protection, zero. And vaccines are given to children. Why did this happen? Um, U.S. Senate Committee in 1985, there was a DPT vaccine, diphtheria pertussis tetanus. It was causing brain injury and death. The amount of liability payments paid out by the three vaccine manufacturers at this time was greater than the revenue that they were taking in. There was so much damage from this vaccine. Two companies closed. The only one open was Ladural. The only one that was left was Ladural. They paid out, as you can see, 10 million to 45 point. 10 to 45.6 million, 200 lawsuits filed. Um, in Japan, they halted this when they saw the death and damage that was happening, and they started doing research on acellular vaccines. The U.S. company saw this. They did nothing about it. The only reason that this was halted was because a woman, Leah Thompson, did a movie 
consumer advocacy from the people, vaccine roulette, and because of this movie and because of these deaths, we ended up with the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. So that obviously, as I said, broke the market forces, but then we get into the fundamental flaw of all of it. Not only did they give total liability to the pharmaceutical companies for the three existing vaccines at the time, they gave it for any future vaccine. A pharmaceutical cannot company cannot be sued for childhood vaccines. Vaccines, especially childhood vaccines, are administered according to a schedule which now comprises 70 doses covering 16 vaccines. The schedule-based combination effects of these 70 vaccines have not been tested. Adverse effects are unknown. This is all documented in the science. We went from three vaccines to now we have, this is the childhood schedule. Here's the other childhood schedule, which might be better for you to see. In 1983, you're not on the same one, I am, my apologies. Is that going on the whole time? Oh, it's offline, I'm so sorry. I didn't no, even sorry. realize. It was fine. It was fine? Okay, yeah, sorry about that. So 1983, um, we had these three vaccines. This is from 1983, but sorry, it's going on its own now. Um, I'm just catching up. And now it's not responding. Is there something going on, Kiki? Do you mind helping me? Yeah, I'm not sure. On my end, it looks like you're still screen sharing. You have total access and control. <laughs> so I'm okay, yeah. okay, well, I'll just go with this one. Um, it's not showing you the other one right now. Sorry, I don't know what happened. It's not responding. Do you have a copy of this you could send to us? We'll post it on our webpage. I can, but I really wanted to sort of stay on that. Okay, page. well, I'm going to see you. Yeah. I just don't want to waste okay, that. Okay, no. It's totally like off on my thing. Um, I'm so sorry. I feel like I really want to fix it. So you guys want to like it's like an automatic slideshow. Yeah, do you want to take it down for a second and then put it back yeah, up? Yeah, take it down, put it back up. Right. It's time for your younger. They were going to do that. Yeah. Just hit stop share. Stop share. Sorry. So sorry. <laughs> Okay. Um, that's it for something. Okay. Should I put it on a slideshow? Is that going to work for me? Okay. So I'm so sorry. I really apologize for that. So basically, you can see, once the Vaccine Injury Act passed and pharmaceutical companies were not liable for vaccines, you can see how many vaccines there were in the green, and now you can see 2023 how many vaccines there are now. They have zero liability. You do not sue a pharmaceutical company if you have a problem. You sue the FDA who's supposed to verify the safety. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, okay. So... So I'm just going to I understand you. that you're laying some groundwork for your um, objection to right. section four. I'll just keep going without the slides. Right. So we have the, yeah, and you're focused on the possibility that vaccines will be unleashed, but I'm going to suggest that you try to get to the section. I will keep, yes, I will. So basically, I'm just going to read and then I'll have to show this to you. So basically, the majority of vaccines at, at that time have had mercury in them. Um, there's no longer mercury in any of the vaccines except for the flu vaccines, but instead they're using, yeah. Yeah, that was the thimerosal. Instead, they're using aluminum. So now you have another neurotoxin loaded into the majority of vaccines. Um, and there's plenty of research on that. Oh, here we are. Look, back at it. Okay. So there's plenty of research on aluminum as a neurotoxin. Um, okay. Um, and then at this point, from a clinical trial standpoint, Vaccines have very small windows of safety review. So literally the vaccine given the first day a baby is born is studied for five days, for five days, okay? Um, hep B 
polio, Hib, DTAP, PC, PCV13, six months, 28 days is the most at DTAP. That's the longest that these have been studied for, okay? And all of the research is there. You can see, well, you can't see. <laughs> oh, here it is. Okay, so this is HPV, the Recombivax vaccine. And it's not anymore. So anyway, that's three, five days of research in which that was studied. Um, so sorry, you know. We have two other bills we have to do today. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have a we're gonna ask you to end and uh, I'll just like, take a few more five minutes. Yeah. Okay, long, that's fine. But... Um, this is longer than we've given anyone else. Thank you. So, and I'm, I apologize, but I want you to know the long-term vaccine effects. This is a quote from National Institute of Health. It should be noted that the biomedical literature is very sparse with studies on long-term vaccine effects, especially long-term adverse effects. These have not been studied in the long term. Um, the two main categories that you see for problems with vaccines, autoimmune and neurological diseases, um, and these can come up immediately or three years in the future. And that's never been studied. When you look, for example, with hepatitis B vaccine, multiple sclerosis, optic neuritis, vasculitis, arthritis, there's tons of autoimmune conditions attached to these and they're not being looked at and the pharmaceutical companies are not being held liable at all. Um, you have, I'm not gonna get into the antibody part. Foreign proteins being injected into people in which you mount an immune response with antibodies is going to attack other tissue. That's exactly what you guys looked at when you're talking about genetically modified food. All of these, the majority of these are recombinant genetically modified vaccines. That's what we're looking at. We're talking about injecting a foreign protein into somebody's body with aluminum. I mean, if you stop and think about that, does that make sense? Is that how we really are healthy? Um, HPV and hepatitis vaccines in particular are a big problem. Um, MMR vaccines, DTAP, HPV, none of them have been evaluated for cancer, for mutagen, for causing damage to genetic material, or impairment for um, fertility issues. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, because the vaccine manufacturers were offered this immunity, what ended up happening was the Secretary of Health and Human Services, they came in and that, that is now who you sue if there is a problem. Um, you, for according to the 1986 National Vaccine Injury Act, um, they were supposed to file a report for damage. That's not happened. There was never a report filed. They were supposed to have a task force that was disbanded in 1988. So you do not have anybody who's really looking out for the safety of these vaccines. The pharmaceutical companies are not doing it and the regulating agencies are not doing it. There's been massive ethics violations um, according to congressional reports by Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services, 2000, 2009. Even Senator um, Bernie Sanders, he talked about, um, quote, the drug company spent over 4.5 billion on lobbying and hundreds of millions of dollars in campaign contributions over the past 20 years. I'm summarizing obviously, but the past nine out of 10 FDA commissioners have gone to work for pharmaceutical companies. So the big question is who are the regulated agencies, who are the regulating agencies protecting? It is not the people. And that's where it's up to the parents or it's up to somebody like DCF to be able to step in and do the research and ensure that informed consent happened. Um, all throughout the Department of Health, you've got revolving door issues. Um, oh yeah, I'm just, um, so anyway, I'm getting there. Um, the other thing I just want to say from a nutrition standpoint, when I talk to my students, um, Fred Comero, he was a researcher, a lipid biochemist, and he sued the FDA because Crisco came out in 1908, trans fat, hydrogenated oil, heart disease, right? Um, 102 he lived to be, it took a hundred years for them to deal with trans fat, which has caused so much damage. So for us to think that we're gonna rely on regulators to keep people safe is not a good idea, especially when it comes to vaccines. Um, so there's a lot of ethical issues with the CDC and the FDA. And then we get into experimentation on kids with vaccines. So AIDS research in New York City, um, and I just want you to know in this, if you have a chance, I did note all of the research that happens on the global south with vaccines. You've got 
Peru, Nigeria, India, Philippines, vaccine research happening all the time on these children. Um, HIV research going on all the time. There is nobody looking out for the kids and that's where we've got to have an advocate, a parent or somebody to be able to do that. Um, at this point for the vaccine court, when you sue the Department of Health and Human Services, they've paid out $5 billion in vaccine damage. Yet they keep saying these are safe and effective and safe and effective and safe and effective. Five billion dollars. And who do they have protecting that? The Department of Justice. So, so I'm going to ask you then to. I am wrapping up. Yeah. Please wrap up yeah. because yeah. we've moved a long way away. From All of this is documented and understood. Yeah. I just it, it has to be put in context though. In order for you I, to we understand, understand. I'll we wrap understand up. I understand the context <laughs> you're making. The the what I also though want to make sure is clear is this is why it's a lightning rod. It's not just parents saying don't touch my kids. It's also parents saying what about these kids who don't have an advocate and look at the history here. And so if you have time, haha, you in know, your spare time, if you can check it out, because obviously we have pharmaceutical companies have been sued. Um, there's plenty of experimentation. And uh, the other last thing that I have in here is um, just all of the sexually transmitted diseases that are coming down the pipeline. Right. Um, all of the vaccines for these, chlamydia, gonorrhea, this is definitely what the intention is. Um, from the next vaccine market. And if we open that floodgate, all of these kids without protection are gonna be exposed to this. Um, so anyway, there's plenty more. I'm sorry I went over my time. Thank you for your time. No, thank you. It brought a lot of information. We appreciate the time. And if you could share that on I our webpage. On and I also have last night at 10 o'clock, I did read Dr. Ryder's testimony. So okay. it's not that we don't read the testimony. This is why we need someone to help with informed consent. Please, this is a package insert for HPV. And as Dr. Ryder mentioned, two children just died recently on that. Okay, sorry it didn't work out, but thank you. Thanks for your time. No, thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Um, and I don't know that there are questions here. Yeah. Uh, but I would like to have Jen come up just really briefly and explain what the language is for, because we need to get back to that. The section four is what uh, folks have been Thank talking you. about, as well as the so the prevention yeah. and the treatment. Cool. And and Dr. Stein, you're still there. Um, if you have some testimony that you would like to send in uh, that we can post on our web page, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning, Jen. Jen Carvey, Legislative Council. Um, so, you wanted to look at the language in the just bill really briefly that, that's in in the bill. Yeah, I just was hoping that someone could also just explain that in bills there are oftentimes a bunch of different provisions that are you know unrelated. Yeah, unrelated, and, and but they're not. There's no subterfuge. It's not hidden. It's not manipulation. It's just the way we write bills, and that. The titles of bills are not always fully explanatory. So thank you. We've done it. Thank you. You've done a great job. I think you've done, done, it. It. You've done that well. We have to try to you know come up with a few word bill title that right. encapsulates um you know the general mm -hmm. um general content. It's specific enough to distinguish a bill from other bills on similar topics, so we don't name all of our bills in here and not relating right. to health. Um but we also we don't do go and well, super involved. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to, you know, give me taking the voice. Um, uh, but we also try to keep them fairly short. Sometimes bill contents change. Sometimes we change the title. Sometimes um, it still works well enough. It's really um, meant to be generally descriptive. As far as the order of bills, as you can see from the bill as introduced to the committee's strike all amendment. Um, you know, there's different ways to organize bills. I think in the in the bill introduced, this was put with some other provisions around preventable reader assistance heading titled prevention. I was having trouble. I didn't draft the bill, so I was having a little oh, trouble organizing it. Right. So when I redrafted it, I just put it all into numerical order by title and section number within that title. So 
Um, this provision is in 18 BSA chapter 21, so I put it in between 18 BSA chapter 13 and uh, provision in 18 BSA chapter 221. All right. That is the... So we get a lot of criticism for a lot of different things, so it's important, I think, to clarify. Yes, the placement in where it is in the bill is entirely due to my organization built by section number. Um, all right, and I'm trying to just pull up this part. Most like you can keep latest version one seventy one. Here's okay. I've, I've got it. Um, I think we're using up our bandwidth. This is so slow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was just going to ask, and now I don't even have to ask. Thank you. All right, there we go. So this is the section of, I put up draft 1.1 of S the S-151, um, the draft committee strike all amendment. This is section four, was well, section seven in the bill that would allow minors to consent to preventive services um, and treatment. I consolidated them by pointing to the existing statute on treatment allowing a minor 12 years of age or older to consent to medical care by a licensed physician related to the prevention of a sexually transmitted infection. Um, talks about how the impact of that is that consent shall not be subject to disaffirmance due to the minority of the individual consenting, meaning, yes, this allows a minor to give consent when otherwise the age of consent um, or unspecified for anything that's not specified otherwise by law is 18. Uh, and consent of the parent or guardian is not necessary to authorize care. And then I pointed to uh, the provisions of 18 BSA 4226 that already allow a minor 12 years of age or older who has or is suspected to have a sexually transmitted infection to consent to treatment. He referred to that provision. So it's not adding treatment, the treatment language here. It's just You're putting it together. Right. It's putting it together. A little awkward the way the existing statute is framed because it's in the chapter on regulated drugs. Um, oh, and so which is controlled substances. Um, so it started out, I think, as consent to treatment for dependence on controlled substances, it was expanded to include alcoholism and then dependence on alcohol, and then to include uh, treatment for video All right, thank you. So that offers some clarity. Okay, I think that, that we're good on that one. Um, and we'll, as I said before, we'll come back to 151 next week. Um, and then we'll, after we've heard some testimony on any any other language in the bill, we know that there are other proposals coming uh, from outside the committee, and the committee may also have some proposals for inclusion. So we'll look at everything and take testimony. That. We're good. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we're going to a little bit behind in schedule, but I think we'll be okay in terms of um age here. And yeah, we are. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Which bill shall we discuss? I think oh, you had uh, the uh, 192. Okay. And so we might want to look at that because I think it was a lot we were ready to move ahead on that bill. It's about to be okay. votes. I will pull up the latest version. Keeping the Glen Office of Legislative Council. 8.1. We have draft 8.1. Mm -hmm. We made a few changes yesterday. They're highlighted in yellow. Can I just uh -huh. so, did you see the email? The, the, 
Oh, disability oh, rights was never invited. Well, um, I had to ask that they be invited to. I thought we had invited them to testify. I said that they hadn't been, been invited. Uh, I did not see the email. I think it came to all of us just this morning. So oh. it just came in. Oh. <laughs> and I talked to I talked to Susan this morning, and she didn't say anything. So. This is from George McGregor. Oh, George McGregor. So that's from a different organization. They oh, actually, that's yeah. disability. Okay, I invited yeah. the council. Yeah. Did, were they, did he ask to be invited? I mean, they're I the mental, I had asked them to be invited because okay. they're the mental health ombuds people. Did um, you get that? Did you get that? Well, I had asked okay. in committee. I mean, right. I, that, but it's a glitch. Well, I mean, yeah, we can bring him in. I, I know that people want to vote on the bill, and I... Oh, we'll, we'll bring him in. Ask him if he's available right now. We can zoom in. Let's go through what we have, and then we'll see if he's available. Okay. Uh, I'll walk you through the changes. There were only a few, and they were in the second half of the bill. So I'm going to scroll down um, to the portion of the bill on intellectual disabilities. I read this last night, too. Well, I'm reading Page. Um, it's page 20, um, so we are in um, 8845, which is our initial order. Um, and this is intellectual disabilities? Yes, yes. Um, so in subdivision two, um, we had that long conversation about where if somebody petitions the court after 90 days, where is that happening? And that would be decided it would happen in the family division. So I've made this change in two places. So we're crystal clear. It's here in this section 8845, and it's in the next section 8846, um, which is the continued treatment. So that is both places. And then um, there was a request for language on the top of page 21 that the committing court. Um, shall automatically review any placement at a forensic facility 90 days after commitment to ensure that the placement remains the least restrictive, the least restrictive setting adequate to meet the person's needs. So that is automatic. The committing court is doing it. The committing court, in this case, the initial order would be um, So that's consistent with what we had talked about yesterday. First, from the Superior Court, that's the Commandment Court. I don't want that sentence in the next section, too. That's Which one? The automatic 90 days. Yeah, that's, yeah. I went through that last night in my head, so, okay, what, what do we do with that? Let's, what would it read? If, let's put it on page 23, yeah. subdivision 2. It's the same language, but yes, in this sir. case, the committing court would be the family division. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll make that change right now. We'll call it draft 8.2. <laughs> You're just trying for, for the to get the most draft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could have a 9.1. <laughs> Your choice. Okay. What's the record? Oh, I've drafted them. Like 17. Yeah. yeah. This is nothing. <laughs> okay. All right. Were there other changes or were those oh, the two? two. The two. Not sure of the house. It's 150 <laughs> okay. yeah. Did you have a question? Well, no, I just wanted to say, I mean, yes, we are maybe all tired of this bill, but we also might be okay with the contents at this point. So, yeah. I, you know, just for the record, it's not just that we're tired of the bill. FYI. Oh, so we're tired of I don't, I'm, I'm tired of working on the bill. It's been a long time. I also think that this bill has pretty large implications for some people, and maybe it's only a few people, but they're really large implications, and we shouldn't be taking it lightly. I agree. And so please we, don't accuse me of taking it lightly. I'm not. I didn't for accuse anyone, you of that. Or anyone but... in this committee. It's that we've worked a lot on this bill. Of course, it has implications. It'll never be perfect. And we're trying to get to a solution that is the best that we have. And and your idea of the best might be different from mine. I understand that. I, I had asked for a witness to come in and he didn't get invited. So I'd like to hear from them. Have you heard about 
Okay, so let's move on then. Any questions on this for Katie? So we'll, we'll, we're okay with this language? So we can put it into the next, hopefully, final draft. Okay. Well, we did, we have for um, number of points. Okay. So we are on, and, and I would say uh, that if we can hear from disability rights today or tomorrow, um, if otherwise we're gonna we'll, we'll put this up for vote tomorrow and uh, go forward. We can always listen to ex post facto. We can listen to testimony. Should I send this to Kiki? That's new version. Yes, please. Okay. There are a number of people who have come in and asked us to testify. We've got it. I thought we could ask to Right. What are we on then? I'm also asking to comment, so I'm just sending Kiki the new version where I added that provision of 8846. Um, you also asked me to come in to talk about 189. I think you, we've already walked through the latest changes. Yeah, um, let's look at it again. Oh. Any I think there was some you? concurrence from the people in the room on that bill. Um, I, and I and I also did hear from um, Liz, I don't remember your last name. Yep. You may want to, uh, might ask you to comment and come up and talk briefly after we go through the bill. That's on what it's 2.2.1. You, I had to go, you know, how you can sort by bill number and then go into drafts on your web page uh -huh. instead of date. That's how I took it. Yeah, so we should have this bill posted up to Kiki. Oh, so I see. Wow. That's like dominoes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Here we are. You ready? Yeah. Okay, please. So this is um, amendment draft 2.1 of the amendment. And this is the bill on mental health um, crisis response. Um, if you remember, earlier versions had protocols and you decided to change it to guidelines. So now the language is that the department is to develop guidelines for use by municipalities, including use by um, EMTs and public safety personnel, such as law enforcement and firefighters who are employed, volunteer under contract with the municipality. The guidelines shall recommend best practices for de-escalation and for mental health response services, including crisis response. Uh, the department shall make the guidelines available versus distribute to municipalities and publish the guidelines on the department's website. And you had a new subsection B that replaced the MOU language with other state agencies um, that in developing the guidelines required pursuant to subsection A of this section, <laughs> the department shall consult with the following entities, uh, Department of Health, Dale, EPS, Vermont Care Partners, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, uh, Vermont Chapter of NAMI, Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and any other entity the department deems appropriate. This would take effect July 1 of 24, and you would be changing the name on passage to an act relating to mental health response service guidelines. <laughs> this is false. <laughs> Good work. Okay. Did we miss anybody up there? Yeah, the Vermont Criminal Justice Criminal Council. Justice Council. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. So you probably should just click that, 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 that'll, okay. Is the language from the um, social workers that we got that yet? No, actually that's why I'm asking Liz. Okay. Okay. But you've got copies. Yeah. So, yeah. Why, yeah. so Katie, you can. I can make that change. Yes. Yeah. So, welcome. Oh, do you, do you want yeah. me up here or do you want me? Come right up to, the, to the housing. Great. Good. Hi all, good morning. For the record, my name is Liz Mills. I'm an advocate uh, with Satchel Rifle Consulting here on behalf of the National Association of Social Workers. So thank you so much for your work so far on S189. We are asking you today to consider an amendment 
that would create a community working group for looking at social service worker protections. Um, as you all might be aware, there have been two social workers in the last eight years in Vermont that have um, been killed by a client and their place of employment. Um, and we we're asking community members to allow this group to um, assemble and then uh, report back to this committee as well as uh, several judici the judiciary. Um, to report back findings and see what the legislature and we all can work on together to protect uh, workers while they're doing this important work. Um, I have in front of me, I've got three copies of two different potential amendments. It depends on what you all are wanting. This will be fun. Yes, one, uh, one is more general and it gives you all more discretion on who you'd like to see on this council and group. And then the second one lists out potential um, individuals we thought Yes, yes, sure. So what I'm going to suggest is we have Kiki made copies of those so that Perfect. we can actually look at them. Uh, Absolutely. Unless you have them electronically. I do have them electronically. I can also send them to Can Kiki you just send them to Do you Kiki? have five copies? I have three. She's got uh, oh, three copies so yes. of two different things. Yeah, I did not. Three copies of three different things. No, uh, three copies of two different. Yeah. And the language is very similar in both. One of them just lists out. Maybe we could share on this. I want to share. Yeah. 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 Yes. So here's for uh, your sure. to be shared. And then here's two. Thank you. One version here. And then for this side, and it's the chair. If you would mind passing down. I'll share that PC. Mm -hmm. Which one do you want? Do you have one? I'm going to grab my laptop or my iPad. Right. Right. Oh, goodness. Very perfect. perfect. So, and we can start with either, both of them are um, fairly straightforward here. Actually, you want to start with the little one or the big one? Yeah, we can start with the little one, that's fine. I'm actually going to email that to myself right now, excuse me here. But you can have to make that second. Absolutely, yes. Okay, my plan. Okay, perfect. Let me grab that really quickly. Oh, gosh. I'm really glad you brought this to us. It's oh, so I'm important. Sorry to Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and Katie, I'm sorry, what was your email? It's Katie. Um, I'll write it down for you. Oh, so appreciate it. Thank you so much. Is this we're open? Do we, can I ask a question? Sure. Or I'm sure. Are we waiting for it? Uh -huh. And just looking at these, I'm I'm wondering, are you are you suggesting this instead of what's in the bill, or in addition to what's in the bill? I'm unclear. Yes. Yeah, so this would be an addition to the bill. She wants to add this as an amendment to the okay. bill. Yes. So guy, ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. So this goes. Why not just do it? Why does it have to be in legislation? So we would like some clarification here so that we can come back to the legislature and that there is some direction. We want to use, work with you all as partners in this work, um, and especially since you all have been so forward thinking with, you know, like working with, especially on this bill, um, that we ask that you be partners in this work. Um, the community members and community groups are already uh, looking at this and looking at their own uh, ways to keep their workers safe, but having legislature as a partner allows us to, to have a larger stand and a more statewide stand on this as well, instead of having different community groups. So you, the, the list that you have on the little one is shorter than the list on the big one. Yes, the we small- want to just the, list them all and say we're gonna reach out to this, these groups? Or? So the smaller list, it gives you all more discretion, especially if we, for whatever reason, may have missed a group that you think is really important. Um, otherwise, that longer list, um, almost all of those folks have already said that they would volunteer their time. Um, we are thinking even this could go from you know, the four uh, meetings outlined to even just doing a full day uh, group meeting on, on this work. Well, so I'm not, we can't command groups to meet. We, right. you know, we can't tell these groups that they can meet. Uh, Five or six times, we can suggest if they if they come in, we can suggest we do that. Katie, help help us with this one. I, I don't have the language. Yes, I'm yeah. sorry, and I am having yeah. a heck of a time here, Katie. I'm sorry. That's okay. Getting the email to yours here. Okay, that's just that. And I can 
I will after this. So I'm um, sure. Yes. So sorry. It's good. No, you're fine. You're, you're great. I see. I, I I agree with you, and I think that um, setting up a formal group like this, we would have to pay them, and it would cost money. Um, so I'm wondering if just this more short version, but that says, I mean, I hear you, and um, definitely think that this is worthy to a chat. Yeah. Um, and moving. I know that social workers are on the front line and have had, and my sister's a social worker. I know the really difficult situation she goes into. Um, so I want to, I think this is really important to add, but I think the sort of more informal version that says that you all or your organization, the organization you're representing would take the lead and check in with all these other groups to get and, and, and perhaps I I don't remember what's at the end yeah. of the paragraph, but then perhaps to uh, you have the report coming back to us. You should have the report coming back to us. You've got that up on yeah. the top, but also uh, which would include the number of meetings and the you know the right. who attended some of the some of the logistical pieces, so we understand. Um, you know, was there a critical mass involved in yeah. doing this, or did you just write it up yourself? No, I'm perfect. not doing that. I no, I'm not. I don't know. This has been a consultation with uh, many different organizations. Um, but yeah, yes, that that makes a lot of sense. So, Katie, I would just, if if you want me to draft this up, I would need some clarity around the results of its work, like what the work entails. Is it a survey? Is it an analysis? I, um, it's just a little bit vague, so I think that would be helpful for me to be able to draft that. Okay. Just one question. What's a substance use provider? So we were when we were talking about this, and that that was something that you know talking with you all as well as working uh, additionally with NASW just to try to get a wide variety of voices in that. And what is a substance use provider? So it can be, yeah. and that's and that's kind of why it is um, labeled as that because there are so many different uh, types of providers. Um, or, could be a doctor, yes. a counselor. Right, I mean, it's and it works as a community, uh, community um, organization, and so that's and so maybe when we're talking about this, it, it, right? I don't think that's the right term actually. Okay. Um, yeah, because it's not a provider who yeah. it's a substance use treatment provider, or substance, substance use prevention use. or counselor. Yeah. So not a substance use provider, but a right a, a counselor yeah. or um, some kind of professional who. Yeah, deals with treatment and prevention. Yeah, so, but I think that just having the more informal list. Yeah. Well, how, how do we feel about this? I mean, while you're sitting it all way, I like the I like the shorter one, but then with the with the additions that that Katie has asked for, you know, and then uh, some kind of a, a report a presentation back to the committee's presentation will save a lot of time. You can do a PowerPoint and provide all the data and the, the meetings you've had and the people involved can all be PowerPoint. So right. it doesn't have to be big report. Yes, that would be good. Even we do that. Yeah, I, my thought is that we usually don't direct uh, private entity. I know, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. If we usually say a department does this work in consultation with so we should have the Department of Health. Oh, EH. Yeah, I mean, this touches yeah, their on. Their Department of Health is in that. This touches on guidelines. Maybe the agency. <laughs> the Agency of Human Services. Okay, so the agency will do a presentation in mm -hmm. consultation with. I didn't hear you. I was... Sorry. The, so the language would be that the agency will provide a presentation in consultation with the social worker group um, and the results of the group's work, but we have to figure out what the group's work entails. Okay. Nicole. Well, she was trying to hide. I could see that. Yes. Yes. I, uh, we, we, I can, we can talk about one and, and um, how to work Maybe. Out on something. Bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> So this is great. I, I feel really good about this. I'm so pleased that you uh, asked, uh, talked with me about this. Yes. And, and thank you all for being open to this. And we look forward to continuing working with you in the future. So here's my here's my ask. Yeah. Because we're so close to the end of this bill. 
that if we had something tomorrow morning, so what I can do. It's up to Kate. I mean, Kate is I mean, I would, I can do that. I will need um, more information about what the work is by, you know, in the next hour or two. Yes. Okay. okay. Great. Yes. Okay. Exciting. Thank, thank you. Yes. Thank you all so much. We'll look forward to the report. That's the yes. Part. Yes. Next, yeah. next, the next, next, next session. Perfect. Thank all you right. all. Thanks, Liz. All right. Thank you very much. So now we have uh, Lindsay Owen, who's available by Zoom. Did you send her the Zoom? I did. Sure. In the current meeting. Okay, well, bring her in. She's the Executive Director of Disability um, Vermont Rights, and she's here. She's on her way. way. Oh, absolutely. I have to leave the road for another committee. Okay, I'm we'll trying to finish. Okay. Oh, you didn't make this on the smash. Do you work with Virginia? Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's leave it out. Yes. Sorry. Or technology today. So my suggestion for tomorrow is we have 98, that's 98, um, and the Fremont Care Board continues to come back and say, regardless of what we do, even if we start at a very lowest level and want five physicians and $500,000, how that works. So um, look at the bill and think about what we've been trying to do in terms of the transition from low to high. And um, the Medicare negotiations or Medicare drug piece doesn't begin until uh, is it 26? Yeah, 26, I believe. So there's still some time for a structural organization, but they still need money and resources to do this work. So think about, go through that bill again, please, and then think about what is anything we can do to keep it moving on. Medicare, to the, the, I thought it began already. I thought they did. Yeah, sure, the, the first drugs. drugs. I don't know whether the first drugs are, I think there's some something that happens at 24, but I think the real big thing that happens is in 26. We'll have to okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Lindsay, you are here. Welcome. Yes. Hi. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, for some reason, you did not get invited into our committee, and uh, we regret that. We very much would like to hear your comments comments on S-192. And just to let you know that we've gotten, now we're on uh, draft eight point something. Uh, so we're, <laughs> yeah, we're far along. And I, I think that you've probably been keeping an eye on this. And let me ask you if you have been watching uh, the bill. Yes, I've been I've been doing my best to to stay on top of it. Um, and I know that there have been multiple drafts um, and I've had some of my staff following along as well. So I can do my best to provide some feedback today and I can also fo follow up with something in writing if the committee would like me to do that as well. Yes, we would. OK. All right. Terrific. So so go ahead. Stay, uh, so um, I don't think you've been in before. I know you've, uh, that I've worked with you in the past on some sort of working group stuff. But I'm the committee introduced themselves. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Martine Laracular. Nice to see you um, from Chittenden Central. Good to morning. see you. Morning, Lindsay. Dave Weeds, uh, representing Rowan County. Jenny Lyons, Chittenden Southeast. That's Terry Williams, this chair, um, <laughs> Senator from Rutland, and I'm Ruth Hardy from the Addison District. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all. Um, I'm Lindsay Owen. I'm the executive director at Disability Rights Vermont. Um, I think it was one of the first meetings or so someone, Sue Aronoff, had mentioned um, Disability Rights Vermont by way of Woodside and that litigation that we were involved in. Um, and so I did have an opportunity to introduce myself at that time. So I appreciate the invitation now to speak with you all about S-192. Um, I think in terms of where the bill is at now, my comments would be that I think 
uh, there needs to be a lot of careful consideration around the due process rights of these individuals and to the extent that there are decisions being made about how long somebody is in a placement and whether or not that placement is renewed, I really do think that there's a lot of conflict of interest if that stays in house within the departments, either Dale or, or DMH. Um, it's it's sort of like I don't know if anyone's following the home and community based services, but you know there was supposed to be a separation of like case management and then providing the services. So um, I think you know it, to be cautious and considerate of these individuals, it really needs to be an outside outside of Dale perspective on whether or not the treatment and the placement in this facility is is appropriate um, and to continue because. Disability Rights Vermont's opinion uh, from the beginning is that is whether or not this facility is even necessary based on the number of folks that might be eligible for this and the testimony that people have provided that has alluded to this, this could happen in the community. And so we would just want this committee and whatever the process turns out to look like just to have as many safeguards in place that this is a last resort and that really the least restrictive settings are considered first and really um, a good faith effort to place people and keep people in the community to the extent possible. Um, thank you. And I, you know, I think your concerns are concerns shared, at least I share those concerns. And it, it's something that we've talked about in the beginning, the whole point was due process and with, you know, it's, that conceivably we're looking at jail for these for this one person, and that's not the best place at all. And so to ensure there are some services available, I think is key into what you're suggesting, as well as having the, the safety um, valves along the way. We've tried to add that in I, as of the latest today with the 90 day review after Superior Court um, placement. Uh, um, yeah, so thank you for that very much. Yes. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, Lindsay, and thanks for jumping on with us uh, so quickly. Um, I had a couple questions. One, you, you, Disability Rights Vermont, are you the official ombudsperson organization for people with mental health um, disabilities? Yes, um, so we were designated by the governor as the mental health care ombudsman because of our appointment as the protection advocacy agency for the state. So, but you're, uh, but you're not the ombudsperson or agency for in intellectual disabilities, is that correct? No, technically there is not. Well, there's a pilot, so Disability Law Project is currently um, in the beginning stages of doing a pilot program for developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities, but that pilot program is not intended to monitor facilities. It's about going into um, shared living provider spaces and, and kind of looking more at the community-based services and providing ombudsman support in those types of settings, and they would not be going into this facility. Um, and so presently, that is that is something that has been lacking in in Vermont um, as the protection and advocacy agency we absolutely um, have the ability and the authority to go into any facility or any space that people are receiving treatment for a disability so we could access we would access this facility absolutely and, and provide some monitoring and oversight okay so that would ha that could happen under current law um, that you would be able to have access to the facility um, correct Okay, and then the other question is one of the things we've heard um, from our ever-present attorneys from Dale and, and DMH, and I say that with great respect because they've done a lot of work on this bill with us, um, and I know they're hovering right now, in fact, I'm sure, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but one, of the, one of the things that they have said is that um, in terms of the um, due process concerns that you brought up. And I, I totally hear you in, in, on that. And that's been one of my concerns as we've gone through the bill. But their argument has been that those due process concerns are addressed within the sort of uh, courts um, and um, process of, of having um, legal aid be the, the you know, uh, 
defense attorney for the per a person who may be placed in a forensic facility or the consideration of being placed in a forensic facility. And so that the due process issues are all out. The agency is making a recommendation, but the due process is handled within the court system. And I wonder what your re response or thoughts are on that. <laughs> yeah, being, um, you know, coming to this meeting a little bit last minute um, and it just being a wild day already, I want to just be very careful about what I, how I respond. Um, you know, as so long as, you know, the judiciary is ultimately making the decision, which is based on, you know, expert opinion from medical providers and, and there really is just a thoughtful conversation um, and discussion around the least restrictive setting and how to best support the person. I mean, I, I'm okay with that. What I what I would be concerned about is um, I think there was some conversation around whether or not a person would have to apply for like reconsideration um, or you know to see if they could get released versus it being an automatic uh, 90 day review or whatnot. And I really do think um, that it's important that there just be automatic reviews at varying stages of their of their commitment or their treatment. Um, and so, yes, I think the court's responsibility, you know, that certainly adds another layer of protection for for these folks, um, even if the recommendation for continued treatment comes from the commissioner or the department. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's helpful. And we did add yesterday in uh, 8.1 or wherever we at, we're at, the automatic 90-day review okay. for people with intellectual disabilities. And my understanding is that is true for people with mental health um, uh, already. already. Um, so that that's helpful to hear. Um, and I guess I, my... My final comment to you is that, you know, this bill still has a long way to go in the House, and I really hope that you make sure you're at the table there to make sure you're involved in the conversation more actively, um, because I think that, you know, we're ready to vote the bill out, I think, and, um, but I, I just want to make sure your eyes are on it in the House to make sure that there's checkbacks within the, the process um, to ensure that the due process considerations throughout um, the uh, the process. So well, I really I really appreciate your comments. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, I will say I will absolutely be more present uh, when it when it moves over to the House. Um, and I lost my train of thought, <laughs> um, but I I think there's. I lost my train of thought. I'll follow up with some written comments, but it sounds like it's moving and um, we will be more active. I just remembered what I was going to say in terms of our role as the ombudsman. Um, we are a very small or minimum allotment PNA, so we have like limited funding. Um, and right now, like the work that we do to monitor all the different facilities in the state is is very challenging as it is. So um, I think DRBT should it now become responsible for monitoring this additional population in this additional facility is really going to be um, it's going to be hard to accomplish unless we do receive some support. I've had conversations with Stuart um, for, from Dale and, you know, we were talking about potential language in the bill or in the statute to, to kind of address that and to make it clear like, OK, we're this is another ask that we're asking of Disability Rights Vermont. And so there should be some way to financially support that because this ombudsman it it would be new it would be additional to like what we're doing now and i would have to you know we'd have to really get up to speed and learn how to best serve this particular population of folks and provide the actual monitoring and right now like we're we're at capacity so um i just wanted to put that out there yeah so, yeah, so every every time you you try to solve a problem you create about 10 others and your your role as disability uh, ombudsperson for intellectual disabilities was something we did identify, as well as some other areas that this bill doesn't um, capture. So I'm I'm glad that you've come in. I'm sorry that you you know were you didn't get in earlier. Um, I I thought that you might ask, but I know Jack McCullough did come in. Uh, he did ask to come in, so that was helpful. We did hear about his the, the program. But. Yes, and 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 I appreciate the invitation. Now, um, I I do like, 
I don't necessarily love to put myself out there, but I will do it. I will do it more often. I usually try and wait to to get invited to things, but I will I will be more proactive in yeah, the future. No, that's for sure. Yeah, no, and and so just honestly, Senator Hardy did suggest that you come in, uh, so it was a it was a missed opportunity for us. But we appreciate your being available short term, very much. And Absolutely, any, thank you. And writing would be helpful. Senator okay. Williams uh, has a question. Uh, intellectual disability and uh, developmental disability. Is there any, is a developmental disability a part of the intellectual disability? Are they connected at all? They certainly, they certainly can be. Um, that's a, that's a good question. Um, at least federally speaking in, in for our funding purposes, I mean, developmental disability is a disability that, you know, impacts, I think, three major life activities and the onset is before the age of 22. So it really just depends on kind of the definition that you're using. Um, but like with mental health um, conditions as well, there's there is a lot of overlap and many people have multiple disabilities. Um, I think for the folks that we serve, typically, like 40% of the folks that we serve have more than one disability, I would say, at least. So it's very, very common that there is there, there is overlap among the different disability categories. So I'm sure there's no, there are very few uh, people with dis developmental disabilities that would be in this type of facility, but if they were and they were under the Dale Commissioner's uh, guardianship, would you have a problem with the, with the Dale uh, Commissioner being involved in actually placement, you know, for a facility. <laughs> What, what I have, what I, what I have a problem with that. Um, There's I think that I would have some, I would have some reservations again. Um, only because, for me, the, this goes back to the beginning of this conversation. Um, you know, when the bill was was essentially born, is 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 identifying what the need is. And I just want to make sure that we're not doing the easiest, um, the easiest outcome or the easiest resolution, the easiest fix for a problem. And so um, I think I would just, I would really want to make sure that um, people are being careful and thoughtful and, and really working to keep people in the community and not just say, okay, we'll put them in this facility for now. So, um, you know, I wor I've worked with Karen and Stuart for a very long time and, and um, you know, I have a lot of respect for them and the, and the commi commissioners as well, but uh, DRBT is always of the position that we need to work harder to keep folks in the community um, as much as possible. And I think we just have some concerns that that doesn't always seem to be the case. Okay, I, mean, I think that the whole process, this, this committee and Everybody that's been involved with it is trying to be as uh, concerned about those things too. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please stay engaged. Absolutely, so, I will. Okay, thank you. I think that we have lost Katie, but she did send us 9.1. Oh, my question of you all committee is, would you like to vote on this today or because uh, I would entertain a motion uh can do that today uh or we can do it um tomorrow morning that's uh, first thing is 9.1 posted yeah sure. it is okay it is it's right there um if it's if it's big uh, we're not meeting this afternoon and tomorrow okay. is the token session to advance bills so regardless of what we do, uh, well, we go on notice probably on Tuesday. Can we just see what the changes to make sure that? Yeah. I'm just scrolling through. I'm assuming they're still in highlighted in yellow. I think she's but... probably taken the highlights. Oh, she has taken. Yeah. So it's, 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 all, it's the bill we just looked at without the highlighting. There's some highlights still. Is there any? Twenty. What page? Twenty twenty one. Twenty and twenty one. Twenty Brady. So the same time, right? Yeah, and because she added that 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 language about the automatic ninety day review right. in another place, that I just wanted to just just uh, sort of the belts and suspenders. Yeah, it's just those divorce notes. Yeah. Okay. 
And so it's 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 now or tomorrow. I'm happy to either one. So I I will move that we um uh, knowing all of the reservations that I have uh, that are on the record multiple times, but I am happy to uh, move draft nine point one of uh. She yes. may have to change it if she takes one ninety-two. Out. So the latest draft. So yeah, just say the draft is presented. Draft nine point one or two. Yeah, or ten. <laughs> we don't know. No, I think I think she can take that. The more the highlight highlight I think she can take the highlights out. We'll do, uh, do another. We'll sit. But they're pretty strict around here. But okay, so that your motion then, Senator, is. To not uh, vote favorably, nine point one draft nine point one slash two of S one ninety two. Oh, nine point one eliminated highlights. Yes, not unhighlighted. Oh, so without great highlights. suggestions. That's why I think there's content. Right, there are four highlights in there, but there's. Uh, do Do I write that? Yes, sure. Please. Okay. Yes, do nine point one. Without no, that highlights, removing, okay. leaving the language, removing the highlights too. Just so nobody's thinking anyone's falling up fast. <laughs> oh. I'll second the motion. Discussion? All right. Clerk, you can call the roll. Yes, I right. get the date. Get the date. Um, The end would be correct. I have to ask you yeah, every single time. <laughs> we do a sort Now it's, oh, I know. It's, yeah. So uh, we will start with uh, me. And I'm a yes. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Williams? Yes. Vice Chair Weeks? Yes. And <laughs> Chair Lyons? Yes. So we will vote at about 8500. Thank you, everybody. Elvis Lawrence. And Senator Lyons. Yeah, it's going to be this. This Because of the way it's been organized now, the bill will be less difficult to report. And after the bill leaves here, um, I've talked to Senator Sears about it, obviously. Uh, he's, oh, right. Yeah. It's, his concern really um, is that victims are included whenever there's a reconsideration uh, for a commitment of placement. And the victim's in there. That's in there. And it is in there, yeah. Um, Katie did a great job with that bill. I mean, yeah. It's much clearer and easier to read than at the beginning. Thank okay. you, Stuart and Karen. So. Thank you folks so much. And I, I wish Katie were there so I could thank her as well. She did a fantastic job, but I want to thank you all for your um, consideration and your hard work. I know this was a lot. So I yeah, agree. We very much appreciate it. And now hopefully you can get us out of your heads. Thank you. <laughs> we need to come here in person so I can chat with you in person. We welcome <laughs> our floating members. Yes. <laughs> We're very pleased that you're here. So thank you very much. And uh, so we're going to call today a wrap. And 